we begin with our gathering prayer. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. We come into this time and space and offer ourselves, our time and these moments of stillness to God. We leave aside for this while our cares and concerns, our fears and frustrations. Or if we cannot leave them aside, we bring them with us into this space and offer them to God. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O oh God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. morning to Andy who's just joined us. Um, I'm just going to light a candle now. If you have a candle at home that you light in your um, prayer space, then, then do light it with me now. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith and hope for the future. We trust in the alchemy of the Holy Spirit to bring her dream to life here amongst us. Gather your people, O God, that your dream for us may come true. So Psalm 9, verses 1 to 10. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> they stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my right and my cause sitting enthroned as my righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name for ever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, God, have never forsaken those who seek you. And we move to our gospel reading. Um, as we read through Mark's Gospel, coming to the end of it now. Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 39. Morning, Janet. Morning, Sam. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely, 
this man was the Son of God. quite a familiar passage to many of us, um, but we tend to hear it read as part of the whole story and we're focusing on the whole drama of the crucifixion rather than on particular details from it. And, and reading through this gospel account as slowly as we are doing our morning prayer helps us to focus on some particular details. So I'll read it out again in a moment for your comments, but just a few things that it makes me wonder about. I wonder whether the people who are saying he's calling Elijah are mocking or whether they are genuinely hopeful that maybe they're going to see something spectacular. I wonder what was going through the mind of the person who ran off and managed to find a way of giving a dying man something to moisten his lips. Some wine vinegar on a sponge on a stick. I wonder if that was a standard thing that was done or an improvised spur of the moment gesture of compassion. And I wonder how brave that was. I wonder whether the fact that Jesus dies immediately after calling on God was the sign that the crowd were looking for something spectacular, God coming to save him. I wonder if that was what made the centurion acknowledge Jesus' divinity. Or I wonder what it was about how Jesus died that gave the centurion that moment of realisation. And I wonder how the centurion felt standing there presiding simply in the line of duty over an execution, a routine day at the office. I wonder how he felt in that moment of realisation. And I wonder when we hear this story, which character you find yourself seeing it from the viewpoint of. Where, where are you standing when this is held, when this is, is heard? At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, 
He said, surely this man was the son of God. I suspect there are a few people asking about why the um, translation is given, which happens a few points in the Gospels. I think it's because the Gospels were written in Greek and Greek was the standard language of the time. So you know, we're talking a very, very multicultural society with people in Jerusalem, in Rome, across the Roman Empire. You've got people who've come in as, as slaves and as citizens of, of you know, many, many different nations. So everyone has a different native language. But Greek is the basic language that everyone speaks. Interestingly, not Latin. Lots of people think that. But Latin was the local language of Rome and Italy. Um, just as Aramaic was the local language of, um, of Palestine. Greek was the, a bit like English today, was the language that most people would have as a second language. So the Gospels are written in very basic Greek. So that they're most easily... Um, so it's, it, it's not obviously originally translated into English, it's translated into the Greek. But they've preserved the actual um, Aramaic words that Jesus says, Aramaic or Hebrew, I'm not sure. Um, I think because the people listening made that mistake about saying he's calling Elijah because of that word Eloi. You know, it means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But... When people were standing, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. I think they heard the word Eloi and thought, oh, he's, he's asking for Elijah. So it's making the point that the people standing by didn't understand what Jesus was saying. They, they heard Eloi and thought, oh, he's talking about Elijah, is he? Mm, well, are, are we going to see Elijah coming? You know, what's, what's going on here? Um, which is a really interesting contrast, isn't it, with that moment, that, that, that moment of complete not getting it at this incredibly dramatic um, climax or nadir of, of the story. There's this moment of total incomprehension of what Jesus is saying, which I guess, I hadn't thought about this before, but I guess functions as a bit of a, a kind of metaphor or image for the whole of Jesus's life so far. It's like he's been talking in a different language and people are, 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 are a half guessing at what some resonances might be, or oh, that word sounds a bit like something we're used to talking about. And then we contrast that at the end of this little passage with this sudden searing moment of recognition. And it seems to me that all through the gospel, and even here at the heart of it, there's this pairing of incomprehension, vague echoes, that, that image from, um, from 1 Corinthians that we'll be coming to as we read through Lent, you know, seeing th as if through a, through a glass darkly, as if in a mirror dimly, a kind of, oh, is, is that what he's talking about? Are we, are we half getting some glimpse of what Jesus is on about? Paired with these moments of, of recognition. Um, and I don't know about you, but that resonates quite strongly with, with my experience of trying to follow Jesus, trying, trying to live a Christian life, that, that so much seems to be about groping dimly to understand what we're meant to see here. And then shot through occasionally with just moments where it all seemed so, well not it all seemed so clear, but something about who this person is. 
just pierces through the, the darkness and the complexity and the, the language issues. But then that moment of piercing brings a whole load of other complexities, doesn't it? I mean, what, what on earth do you do as a centurion who's just presided over a crucifixion with that recognition? What do we do in our normal day-to-day -day lives? How, how do we live? If this is true. Let's move into our times, our time of prayer. In the silence of our own hearts, bring our own thoughts and responses to the crucifixion, to desolation, to God and the weight of the world we bring to the cross. We'll light some candles, metaphorically bring light into what's well, quite a dark reading. So I light this candle for all those people who are undergoing a moment or even an extended time of complete desolation at the moment. For those who would identify most in that reading with three hours of torture, culminating in that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For all those who are bereaved and unable to reach out to others for human comfort. For all those who are struggling with long COVID or other chronic conditions that aren't able to be treated at the moment. For those still in hospitals on ventilators for weeks or even months. For those going stir crazy at home either alone or perhaps with small children or in a difficult family situation with really difficult dynamics in the house. For those who've been kept going by the thought of things being better by spring or by summer or by autumn and are increasingly seeing those hopes seem more insubstantial. For all those living with chronic pain, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Like this candle in thanks for those moments of clarity that sustain us. And for strength for the path that they set us on. I pray for each one of us in our journeys to live enlightened by grappling with these strange ancient stories, grappling in the light of wanting to 
live the way that Jesus shows. Grappling to hold together pain from um, previous experiences of church or of hurt that have come through church with our conviction that truly this is the Son of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. this candle for all our prayer requests in the comments, for all those people and places that we hold before you, O oh God. Crying out to you. Those places and people feeling forsaken. Those places and people in need of healing and peace. For you, every person gathered here now, and watching this later, we pray for your light, your peace and your blessing and your clarity to pierce through the darkness and uncertainty of today. Give us enough light to see the next step for us to take. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. I'm going to use the version um, by Stephen Shakespeare, but please use whichever version you know or have to hand. Divine Mother, Divine Father, to be in you is to be in heaven. May we hear the wonder that echoes in your name. May we accept no rule but the rule of love. May we never tolerate the evil of hunger. May the hurts we cause be forgiven and the hurts we receive be healed. May we remember that we are fragile and cherish the life we share with all. For all love and life and power is the gift of the Spirit. Amen. we hold before God all, all those named in our prayer comments and if you're watching this later then do feel free to add your prayers into the comments and know that we include those too. And the blessing of God, the womb of creation, the word of life and the wind of change be with you today and always. Amen. Join together in our closing affirmation. In the circle of God's love, we are one. The circle is never broken. In the light of God's welcome, we are one. The light never goes out. Let children teach us the wisdom of play. Let neighbours teach us the gentleness of care. May the circle surround us when we are apart 
May the light draw us together again. Amen. Amen. Really good to be with you all this morning. And Lily will be here tomorrow, um, looking at the very end of that part of the story um, and at Jesus' burial. Um, and then Monday and Tuesday next week, um, Louis and I will be looking at the two different endings of Mark's Gospel. There's a shorter ending and then a longer ending. Um, and we'll read through those and then we're going to begin reading 1 Corinthians through Lent. So great to see you. And on Sunday, um, Louis and I will be leading a, um, a Sunday morning communion service here on Facebook. Um, sort of, well, we're not really, we're not doing Valentine's Day in the kind of hearts and kisses and cuddly teddy bears kind of way, but looking at, um, at, at people that we've loved and lost and love and relationship and how much we're missing that this year and so on. So if Valentine's Day normally is something that terrifies you, don't worry, we're not going to, it's not going to be all hearts and flowers. So um, see you again soon. Bye.